so as as I was ready to come up here and gather my water and phone and um, I was reminded uh, about four four years ago I started using glasses for the first time <laughs> and I had them in a nice box, you know, that they give you when they give you your glasses. And so I remember the first Sabbath, I was going to preach with my new glasses. First time ever. So I brought my little box. Uh, I put it in the pulp, on the pulpit. Uh, it was Maranatha in, in Miami, big church. And I told them, listen, today I'm going to use my new glasses for the first time ever. So I'm so excited and I kept building. And then I opened the little box. No glasses. <laughs> I had to preach like that. So I don't have that little box now. I, I carry them like this, right? That's, that's better. But yeah, thank you, Pastor Joseph. Uh, I, I so much appreciate Pastor Joseph. You know, he's way younger than me. Uh, but when we work in the ministerial department, uh, I mentor him and he mentor me, and that's the kind of relationship that we have. We, we mentor each other. In fact, there is a third component in my group, uh, Pastor Fidel Soto. That's, uh, it's three of us that meet uh, on a regular basis. Uh, almost every week we talk and have conversations and dialogue. But yeah, I love to work with young people. So I want to ask, how many young people are here? Let me see your hands. How many young people? Okay, okay. Someone like this. So let, let, let me define what youth is, okay? Youth has nothing to do with age, all right? Youth is a state of the heart. If Jesus Christ is in your heart, then you're young. That's why in heaven we're going we're to have young people. We're going to be constantly in the presence of Jesus Christ. So let me ask again, how many young people we have here? Let me see. Ah, now I feel more comfortable, Pastor Joseph. We're among young people. Excellent, excellent. All right. So there are, there are two Bible verses that are the basis of my uh, preaching, of my sermons. Every time I'm preparing something to share with the church, these are my guiding Bible verses. The first one is Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Malachi 3, 16, all right? It says, Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another. So you got people that fear the Lord, and what are they doing? They're talking to each other. They're having a conversation. Watch. Then it says, and the Lord, what did the Lord do? He what? He listened. He heard them. Right? So, you fear the Lord. You get together with another person or a group that also fears the Lord. And you start talking about God. Right? And then God, He listens to your conversations. And He says, so... A book of remembrance was written before him about what they were talking about. So I love to talk about God. And, and Pastor Joseph will tell you that. that. That's all we do. We talk about God. And, and so today we're going to have a conversation, a dialogue. And even though I always say that when I preach, the dialogue doesn't take place. But in this church, it will take place because you will have an opportunity, what time? 2 p.m. to give your side of the story. All right, so we're going to have a conversation today. We're going to talk about God, amen? amen. And what is God doing? What is he doing? He's listening. The other Bible verse, there are only two Bible verses for me, the basis of my sermons, the other one is found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. And Jesus says this, Therefore, he said, Remember that every scribe or every teacher or every preacher 
well trained for the kingdom of the heavens, is like a householder who brings out of the storehouse, what does he bring? Things what? Things that are new and things that are old. Okay? So the storehouse is the Bible, right? And we bring out two kind of things. Things that are new, things that are old. Now, principle is the new things, by the way, the storehouse is the Bible, the new things never contradict the old things, okay? So why do they call them new things? There are new perspectives, new ways of looking at the old things, all right? But there is consistency with the old and new things. Amen? Can we agree to that? Very good. Let us dive in then into our study today of growing, growing. We're getting to know Jesus. By the way, I think, Pastor Joseph, that this is the bridge to the second part, right? This is the bridge. You grow in order to serve, to let them know. So let's go back to uh, that illustration. Have you seen? You've seen this cartoon, right? Uh, the rabbit on your right is so proud, right? Because from the surface, he's doing great, right? The leaves are great. He's green and taller than, than the rabbit. The rabbit on the left, he's not too, too proud, right? Because look at, from the surface, he's not doing good. But if you dig beneath, right, it's the opposite, correct? Who has the... The biggest carrot. So what we want to suggest today is that in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, is way more important to grow down than to grow up. All right? It's just a suggestion. In the kingdom of God, it's very important to grow down than to grow up. And you have Bible verses like Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you have to become the least. You have to become like a child, right? You're the least, you're the greatest. Okay, so let's see if this works because they told me that if it doesn't work, they're going to help me. So let's see. There you go. Okay, so... The God of humiliation. I am intentionally using that word, humiliation, not humility. You see, humility is a very hygiene word. It's a very positive word. It's a good word. If I say to you that Pastor Joseph is humble, that is good, right? That is humble. He's humble. And then Pastor Joseph will start to feel what? Good about himself, and then he's not humble anymore, right? But, but you see, humility is something that we like. Oh, we like it. But humiliation is not good. It's not good. But that's the word we want to use today in growing. So our mutual friend, Pastor Fidel, he was pastoring in Jacksonville, Florida, while I was at Andrews. And he invited me. He says, can you come and, 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 and give a, a weekend on discipleship, and I said, sure. So I traveled to Jacksonville, Florida, and he says, listen, um, stayed at my home, you know. I know him since Montemorelos. We did undergrad together. I said, I'll stay at your home, so I went. And when I walked into his house, there was a family living with them, and this is not unusual. Pastor Fidel and his wife I believe they have this gift of hospitality. They always have people living in their house, strangers. Uh, sometimes I will ask him, hey, where's your Honda Accord, you know, a car? And he says, oh, somebody in the church needs the car, and they're using it. And I go, like, for the day? No, no, they need it, like, for six months, you know. That, that, that's what they do. This is very normal. Him and the wife. Now, that's important, right? Because if only one of them wants to do that, then they will have trouble. But both of them are like that. 
So when I walk in, I see this couple. They had a set of twins. And so I was not surprised. Uh, they introduced us, you know, and uh, I know his name is Kevin. And, 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 you know, they're living here. Okay. Next day, Pastor Fidel says to me, let's go for a walk. He likes to walk. So we went to walk around the neighborhood. And while we're walking, I said to him, hey, so, so what's the deal with Kevin? What, you know, like, why is Kevin living in your house, right? What's, what's up with Kevin? And without losing a beat, he keeps walking. He says to me, oh, Kevin, um, he says, God is humiliating him. Uh, but, but he'll be fine. I thought, that's strange. God is humiliating him. I always thought uh, the proper way would be God is making him humble, right? No, no, he used that word, God is humiliating him. But he'll be fine. Don't worry. We kept walking. I did my weekend. But I kept that in my mind. And so when I flew back to, to Michigan, those of you that have been there, uh, the nearest air airport in Andrews is uh, in India. And what is it? South Bend. South Bend, Indiana. South Bend. So we landed in South Bend. And a friend of mine who I respect a lot. In fact, he, he works in this conference. About a year ago, he came to work in this conference. His name is Enrique Baez. Uh, he was doing his PhD at that time, Old Testament, you know, very smart guy. And, and, and uh, he was picking me up from the airport in my car. He was driving my car. And so when, when I met him, he says, hey, listen, you drive your car. Let's go back. So I was driving my car. Enrique is sitting next to me. So I thought, I should take advantage of the fact that I have these scholars, this scholar right next to me. And so I asked him, Enrique, listen, I said, you, you've studied Hebrew and the Old Testament and, you know, you have gone deep into it. Can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, in your studies, have you find that God humiliates people? I said, I I'm concerned here. Does God humiliate people? And he said, now you're making me think. That's what he said. Yeah. And, and he waited like a long time. And then he says to me, you're asking the wrong question. I'm like, what? Yeah, you're asking the wrong question. And I said, why? And he says, because here you are. You're so worried. You want to find out if God humiliates you. That's your worry, right? I said, yeah, yeah. He says, you're so worried trying to find out if God humiliates you. And then he says, when the fact is, now listen to this, okay? He says, the fact is, God humiliated himself in order to save you. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do while you're driving, right? Some you shouldn't do, right? You should not eat while you're driving. You should not text. Please do not text while you're driving, right? You know, in my town in Nicaragua, there was a, an old man, but he had a lot of money. He had a lot of money. Everybody knew he had a lot of money, Mr. Monterrey. But he didn't know how to drive. You know, he had a driver. But in, in his mid-80s, 83, 84 years old, he wanted to learn how to drive. So he asked his driver, teach me how to drive. You know, this, these are my cars. And so everybody in my town knew that Mr. Monterey was learning how to drive, you know. And so we will see him sometimes, you know, and he, he drove like this, you know. And, and people will go, Mr. Monterey. And he will go. You know. And then when, when, when the men, all men got in the cor in corners to talk, people will come up to him and say, Mr. Monterey, are you enjoying driving? And he said, my friend, driving is the best experience in the world. Really? Oh, yes. I mean, you use every part of your body when you're driving. He says, you know, you use your uh, right um, uh, feet, yes, or foot. <laughs> and your left and your right hand and arm and your left arm and your eyes. And, and he says, even your tongue. Because you see, when he turns, he will go. <laughs> this is even your tongue you use. It's amazing. So, <laughs> when you're driving, 
there are a lot of things. But when Enrique told me this, you're worried about finding out if God humiliates you when the fact is God humiliated himself in order to save you. I had to stop. I literally stopped. I go, mm. And I said, tell me that again. He said, yeah. God humiliated himself. That's where we start the discussion, right? And so that led me to study this word and this concept very deep in the scripture. In the scripture, for example, for example, we find in Deuteronomy chapter 15, for the poor will never cease from being in the land. Therefore, I, commanded, I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and needy in your land. You see, the word for humiliation is a word in Hebrew uh, that you pronounce it. Uh, let's go to the first slide, if you can help me with it. No, not the first, but the previous slide. It's ani. Can you say ani? Ani. Ani is the Hebrew word for humiliation. It's the same word for a poor person. Okay? Poor person. So ani is constantly mentioned in the Old Testament. And, and if you do a study of this word, God is always taking care of ani. God is very worried that ani is taken care of. Okay? In fact, in Proverbs, you find that if you help a knee, it's as if you're lending money to God, and then the proverb says, and God will pay you back. All right? There are a lot of promises. There are laws that were made in the Old Testament for taking care of a knee, like when they were harvesting, they were supposed to leave some behind for a knee to come and pick it up, right? And, and so, and so I, I, you know, I continue to study the word. You continue to see the mention of a knee in different instances. Uh, let's go. Let's let's go again. Yeah. Uh, it says here, this poor man cried. That's a knee. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard and saved him out of all his troubles. So again, very consistent. God is always taking care of. Ani. Now, can I ask you, have you ever been Ani? Yeah? Have you ever been Ani? Now, many of you have been Ani. So let, let, me, let me define to you Ani in the Old Testament, a poor person, a poor man in the, in, in the Old Testament, is somebody that is naked. He doesn't have clothes, okay? That's how miserable he is. He has no clothes. No shoes. He has no bread, no water. Ani has a wife and children that are begging him for food, but he has nothing to give to them. That's Ani. So there is only one thing he can do. What it, it is to beg. Okay, that's Ani. Is associated with the word humiliation. Again, uh, all the findings were very consistent. Uh, there is a theme of a knee. God is helping them. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, Isaiah says, sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. That's a knee again. You know, the ones that are experiencing humiliation, the ones that are experiencing humiliation. Uh, what I was not expecting, though, in all the study that I did, what surprised me, I was not expecting this. There are poor people. God takes care of a knee. God is expecting his people to take care of a knee. By the way, in the Bible, the responsibility to take care of a knee is never given to the government. It's always given to his people. So the church, the church is supposed to take care of a knee. What I was not expecting is this. God called himself a knee. God not only defends a knee, but he says he is a knee. He is the God of humiliation. There is a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 regarding the Messiah, regarding Jesus. And he says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout out, shout out loud, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. So he's coming victorious, triumphant. And, and, and you're picturing the entrance, a parade of a king coming into the city. And, and you're picturing the king coming riding a stallion, right? That's, that's the picture we get. The king is coming, triumphant. But then he says, humble. That word, you can, you, can, you can, well, don't Google it right now, but later on, you can do a study, is a knee. He says that he's coming as a knee, the God of humiliation, and he's coming riding a and donkey. Not, not a stallion, not a, but a donkey. And you know what else? The donkey was not his. You remember in the New Testament? It's not even his donkey. It's a borrowed donkey. That's humiliation, right? Because that's the king of the universe we're talking about, correct? He's coming into his city, but he's coming riding a donkey. And the donkey is not even his. And the reason the Bible gives us is because he is Ani. He is the God of humiliation. That was surprising to me. And I thought, what is, what is going on here? Why is God saying that he is a need, that he's identifying with humiliation? And so then that led me to do a brief study of the New Testament. And we find Jesus. Remember his birth? You, you, you remember the story of Christmas, right? Story of Christmas. Why do we say, why do we say he was born in a stable? Why? Because what? We say because the inn was what? Full to its capacity, right? That, that's, that's what we hear, right? There was no room, correct? But some of you suggested something that is true. The reason is not that the inn was full to its capacity. So let me illustrate this. Um, before I became a pastor, I used to work uh, in, in, in the tourist industry, specifically in a place called Mazatlan in Mexico. It's in the Pacific Ocean, Mazatlan. I used to work in a hotel called Luna Palace, and my job was public relations. It was so cool because uh, it was just being friendly with the tourists, you know, in English, in Spanish. Hey, welcome. Bienvenido a Mexico. You know, it's nice. Everybody, you made so many friends. So I remember back in those days, it was where in the mid-80s, uh, for young people, we didn't have cell phones in those days. We didn't have Google. We didn't have nothing of that. And so uh, the, the general manager of the hotel walk, it was Easter, uh, and, and he says to the people working on reception and to the people working on, on public relations, he says, we are full to its capacity. There's no more room. Okay. We're like, yeah, good. You know. But about two hours later, uh, 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 a very handsome, tall young man walk into the hotel with a lot of people following him. How do you call that? Ent entourage? Yes. Ah, a lot of people. This man was none other in the Latin world, in the Hispanic world. His name is Alejandro Fernandez. Have you heard of him? Oh, Alejandro, and in the mid-80s, he was not old. He was young, you know, and he was the son of another famous singer, Vicente Fernandez. So Alejandro walks, and everybody goes crazy. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have cell phones to take selfies, no. They got, you know, cameras. But, I mean, every lady in the hotel wanted to take a picture with alejandro even american ladies that i don't think understood spanish oh they're gonna take a picture you know and then he goes and stay in the penthouse but i know for a fact there was no room but he stays in the penthouse later on the general manager walks he, he came down you know and i said me, me, me mr camacho i said mr camacho I thought you say there was no room in the hotel anymore. And he said this. <laughs> well, we're talking about Alejandro Fernandez here. You know, you find a, a place for him. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? 
everywhere in the world, if you have money, they will find a place for you. The reason that the king of the universe was born in a stable, because his family was a knee. You understand? Mary and Joseph were poor. They didn't bring nothing to the table. You understand? Like, there's no room. There, there's a place there where the animals live. Your wife can go there. And so the king of the universe, our savior, was born in a stable. Yes? Among the smell, you know, of animals. You've been around animals, right? Sweat and all the things. That's where our king was born. Now, LNG White says something very interesting. LNG White says that the life of Jesus was one of constant humiliation. She doesn't say that this was an incident. You understand? Oh, it's something that happened in his life. No, she says his life was one of constant humiliation. Every day was a constant humiliation. People didn't know who his father was. You remember the story? It was implied in what they say. We know who our father is, Abraham. But you? We know your mom says she got pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even today, that story is laughable. You understand? If a young lady today says, I'm pregnant, but I've not been with a man, it was the Holy Spirit. What, what are we going to say? Got you, right? Well, in the times of Jesus, this was worse. She, she was going to put people to death by the law. She was supposed to be killed. So, so, so constantly they throw at that at him. We don't know who your dad is. We, we, we don't even, that's humiliation. Is that humiliation? What do you think? It's humiliation. That's not humility. That's humiliation. What else do we have in the life of Jesus Christ? One day, as they went along the way, a man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nest. But the Son of Man has no... He was homeless. He was homeless. This, this is humiliation. The, he's the king of the universe. You understand? He owns everything, yet he said, listen, I don't, I, I'm so sorry. I would like to invite you to my apartment, right? To my house, to my backyard, to my garden. But he said, but actually, even the animals have a place. But the son of man, he has no place. Is that humiliation? I think, I think, I think you're getting it, right? But that's not it. That's not it. I already told you the, the entrance in Jerusalem. A donkey that was borrowed. Humiliation. Let's go to the next one. Oh, you remember this incident, right? It's the Last Supper. Everything is prepared. By the way, the room where the supper took place, it was not his. You remember that? It was also what? Borrow. Do you like to borrow things? Do you like when people offer you? There are people said, I don't like people offering me anything. <laughs> Have you heard people like that? I don't like being handed things. By the way, what's the opposite of that attitude? It's not humiliation. It's what now? Arrogance and pride. Yes? And you know, the Bible has something to say about that. It says that God, listen, looks from the distance. God looks from the distance the one that is arrogant. You're arrogant. God says, yeah, I see you, but I see you from the distance. Instead, he says, he lives in the heart of Ani. He lives in the heart of Ani. Do you see the difference? That's, that's where God feels comfortable. That's his home. Because he is the God of humiliation. You understand? He is the God of humiliation. So, in the Last Supper, try, try to picture, right, the image the movie here, uh, they walk in into the room. Everything is prepared. They said on one corner there's water and towels. And, 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 and have you ever experienced that, right? People walk in and they, they know. They know what's on that corner. They, but they all pretend that it's not there. Like, like 
there's the water, but they all, oh, look, that, that, that's an interesting roof, right? Interesting lamp, looking away from the water, right? Because nobody wants to do that work, right? Nobody wants to what? Why? Why nobody wants to do it? They didn't come prepare. They didn't have time. Why they don't want to do it? Because it's humiliating. That was the work done by? By? Oh, but not just any slave. You see, uh, in the slavery, they had categories. There was seniority. That was the lowest of the lowest of the slaves. And so they don't want to do that. But the Bible says that, listen to this. I need to remind you, in that room, there was only one that was royalty. Only one was royalty in that room. All the others, fishermen, tax collectors. The king of the universe stood up, walked to the corner, right? Tied a towel around his waist and proceeded to do what? To do what? See, I've heard some preachers said. He played the role of a servant. I don't like that. Because playing the role is like pretending. You understand? Acting out. He was not acting out. I want to suggest to you that Jesus was being himself. Because God is the God of humiliation. He couldn't help but to serve. That was his nature. He did that naturally. He couldn't do otherwise. He's being himself. He's not playing a role. He's being himself when he is washing the feet of the disciples in total humiliation. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 2. Paul has a big dilemma. Paul has a big dilemma. Paul is a theologian, you know, like all his concepts... He's a pastor first and foremost, but he's a theologian. I mean, all his theological concepts, they are brought out from the Old Testament. You understand? His Bible was the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. He's responsible for most of the New Testament. So all his theological concepts, he brings them from the Old Testament. So in this passage, he wants to say that God is the God of humiliation. But he has a challenge. He has a problem. Pastor Joseph can understand this. In some languages, there are no direct translation for a single word. You, you understand? You say, I, I know how to say this in Spanish, uh, but how do you say it in English? <sighs> There's no word. Or oh, vice versa, right? Uh, I know how to say this in English, but how do you say it in Spanish? I don't know. There's no direct translation. You understand? So in Greek, there is no direct translation for a knee. But he wants to say that God is a knee, that Jesus is a knee. He wants to say that. So watch the struggle. He says... Let this mind be in you all, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that, that's being God himself, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to hold on, I'm God, I'm God, right? But he, and, and, and you know, because he, he has no word, he has to come up with a statement, and the statement is this, he emptied himself. That's the best he can do. He emptied himself. He humiliated himself. He emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant. You see, brothers and sisters, the creator becoming a creature, the creator becoming a creature is not humility. It's humiliation. He is the creator. But he becomes a creature. But he takes the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the form of a man he what? He humiliated himself even further. How? Becoming what? Obedient. Do you understand that Jesus never had to obey, obey anything? He was king. But now in the form of humiliation, he has to obey. He has to learn to obey. To death, even death. Oh boy. What's wrong with the cross? What's wrong with the cross? This is the worst humiliation. Because you have heard this. You know, artists, they paint Jesus like that. You know, it's dark. Others put a little cloth. But 
if we do some digging into the form of crucifixion, they were crucified naked. <laughs> Can you imagine hanging naked and, 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 and women and children looking at this spectacle? This is not humility. This is humiliation. This is the king of the universe hanging naked, dying as a criminal. And he had done nothing wrong. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Help me out. This is a conversation. Why is he doing that? Ah, now you're adding another component. And I'm going to finish with this. See? Humiliation and love, they go together. This is, this, I'm ending, so, so please pay attention. You cannot have one without the other. Love and humiliation go together. You see, what Hollywood has sold to us is you can have love and be proud and, you know, you're not going to humiliate me. In fact, since we were children, we were thought this, don't allow anybody to, right? We, we've learned that. And we have become what? Experts at defending ourselves. You are not going to. You know how experts we have become? This is how experts we have become and not allowing anybody to humiliate us. We don't even allow God to humiliate us. That's how good we are. That's how good we are. You understand? C.S. Lewis, I love C.S. Lewis. He says this. If you don't want your heart to be broken, if you don't want your heart to be humiliated, he said, don't give your heart to anybody. Then he says, I find this interesting. He says, not even to a pet. <laughs> not even to a pet. He says, you don't want to be humiliated? Don't give your heart to anybody. Don't love anybody. Not even a pet. He says, lock your heart. You know, put, put a lock on your heart. And then throw the key to the ocean. He said, in that situation, nobody's going to humiliate you. But you will, you're going to be the most miserable person in the world. See, those of you that are parents, how many parents are here? You know that when you have a baby in your arms, you know, and, and you know, we, we speak baby language, right? She's so good, right? What a beautiful baby, right? You know that that baby, as beautiful as he or she is, one day is going to humiliate you. <laughs> Probably some of you are saying, yeah, 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 yeah that's true. Right? One day that baby is going to turn to you and say, I wish you were not my father. Right? <sighs> my baby. It's humiliation. The object of your love is always going to humiliate you. In fact, you can only be humiliated by somebody that you love. If you don't love somebody, they're not going to humiliate you. You understand? You can have a political leader saying bad things about uh, Nicaraguans. Hey, I don't care. You're not offended? No. Why? Because I don't love that guy. I don't, I don't care. You understand? But if you love somebody, what that somebody says to you is hurtful. Because I love, right? So there's no such thing as loving without humiliation. Majority of the problems in marriage can be solved if we understand this principle of humiliation. Yes? Majority of problems between parents and children can be solved if we understand this concept of humiliation. Yes? Majority of problems among church members can be solved if we understand this concept of humiliation. But the question is, why? Why does God want to humiliate me? I'm glad you're asking that question. It's very simple. Very difficult, but very simple. This, this, this is how simple it is. God says, because I want you to be like me. That's the answer. I want to humiliate you because I want you to be like me. You see, it's like Jesus is walking on the water and Peter is like, 
Can I go? Can I go? Like, I, I want to feel what it feels, you know, to walk on the water. Jesus, I want to feel what you're feeling. And Jesus says, like, come on, Peter. This is only for God. Come on. He doesn't say that, right? Jesus said, you want to feel what I'm feeling? You want to experience this? Come. Because that's the nature of God. You see, God wants us to be like him. That is growing. Growing is being like God, becoming like God, right? But I get it. You, right now, you're afraid. You're like, oh, humiliation, right? You see, in this humiliation thing, it's like Jesus said, it's better to give than to receive. Do you remember that? You, you know, majority of us like, no. It's better to receive than to give, right? And Jesus says, listen, no, 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 no. That feeling that you feel when somebody gives you a present, it feels good, right? <sighs> right? Jesus, trust me. When you give without expecting anything in return, when you give to somebody that cannot pay you back, that feeling is way, 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 way much better than the feeling of receiving a gift. And only those that have experienced it can understand it. Yes? It's the same thing with humiliation. Unless you experience it, you will always be afraid. Oh, no, no, I don't want humiliation. I don't want to be humiliated. <sighs> By the way, humi this humiliation is not abuse, okay? Let me clarify that. I'm not suggesting that you ought to be uh, allowed to, 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 to be abused emotionally, sexually, physically. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking humiliation that brings down your pride. You understand? Your arrogance. Because you love somebody. Because you have the love of God in your heart. Amen? So, I want to invite the singers. Yes? Singers can come up front. I'm going to sing. But while they're singing, I want you to think about this. You need to allow God to humiliate you. You need to give him permission. You need to give him green light. And it's never too late to do this. Like when you say, God, I'm allowing you to do this in my life, God will say, I've been waiting for you to give me green light for this. I finished preaching this sermon in Jacksonville. I went to sing, and the first elder was standing next to me. And we're singing, and he's having a conversation with me without looking at me. He's singing, and he said this. So, Pastor, does this mean that I have to allow my wife to humiliate me without looking at me? So without looking at him, I say, yeah, that's what it means. And he says to me, Pastor, that's a hard thing. And I said, yeah, I know. Humiliation. Becoming like God. Allowing God and the love of God to prevail so that we can grow, so that we can know Jesus, so that we can serve others. While they're singing, think about this. And if you want to pray with me at the end of the song, come up front, come up front. We're going to ask God, or we're going to give permission to God to do in our life anything and everything he wants to do in our life, all right? So after they finish singing, will you join me here and we can pray together?